Yeah. Yeah. Mike and I were just talking about the difficulty in being able to attract good talent, you know, with certain types of skill sets. Yeah. Uh, in San Antonio, I said, yeah, you yeah. know, sometimes they're unicorns. Yeah, uh, no, they really are. It really is something where they, they tell people, we, when you're a software developer, you can't write the brand in software developer. Like, great software developers are substantial back in the network security that... That, that guy will be very hard to find. At least in San Antonio, maybe not so much in Toronto. That's the degree that needs to be offered now. That's what that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so Matthew is uh, University of Houston Clearway. Do they have a cyber uh, security institute there and uh, uh, started off on the uh, computer science world, uh, going through the software development, you know, aspects uh, and the yeah, that security stuff is just kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Poke my head out, see what that's about. So, yeah. I mean, that's one thing that Berkeley has been really good about, it's just, you know, being engaged with students uh, and trying to identify talent. Uh, you know, that really kind of has an interest because if, they, if it burns within, it's a lot easier to yeah. be able to mentor and work yeah, on. That's, that's, that's my favorite thing about the system. I'm able to work with these really good five, ten people that we can talk to. So, like, easily that. It's not at work. You can have a lot of time to work on it. And it's very difficult to really. So, you don't have to worry about those guys being that way. They can't just go out and work with them. But uh, I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Great. Right. So, yeah. Well, it's been working on it for a while. So. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, uh, I know that goes. Uh, they take a lot longer than they do to deliver. It's, it's the, the big idea, right? The big idea. you got to start small, and, yeah. and then you start to realize it has tentacles. Yeah, well, if you can do this, all we're here with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 uh, I'm going to check in with them and see how we can get started. Oh, she went to go get uh, a plate of food. Show me around here. Uh, or are you going to record everything? Yes. So we, I guess we're ready to get started. Yeah, so uh, Mike, we're going to ask you to kind of stand on the spot if you can. Okay. And we've got it uh, set and forget on that camera over there. Okay. All right. Let me, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the lunch session. Looks like uh, we've uh, filled up many of the tables. Maybe have a few more people outside, but I, I want to go ahead and get started so that Mike Cotton has uh, ample time to be able to go through his talk today. My name is Norman Comstock. I'm president of the uh, Greater Houston Chapter of ISACA. It's very, very good to see all of you. How many of you are members of ISACA, Greater Houston Chapter? Okay, and all of you who did not raise your hand, I hope it's because you had the fork in your hand. And if you, and if it's, that's not the case and you're just not a member, I would definitely, uh, welcome the opportunity for you to check out, uh, our chapter. We have over 1,300 members in, the, uh, the Greater Houston chapter, uh, which is, uh, considered one of the very large chapters uh, on a, uh, international basis. Uh, we have, uh, over 2,300 in our distribution that come, uh, to check out the events. Uh, we, there are so many different, uh, opportunities to be able to, to learn. Uh, listen and network, and so we certainly welcome you to come out to our events. Third Thursday of every month, uh, isacahouston.org. So uh, now it's my pleasure, actually, to uh, introduce Mike Cotton, who serves as the Vice President of Research and Development for Digital Defense. He has over 10 years of information security experience helping to lock down networks for companies in numerous industries and all of all sizes in small businesses to fortune organizations, fortune something. Uh, he has written security software which uh, audits millions of systems a month. The security flaws on the primary operating systems and network side channels. Cotton is uh, called upon frequently to provide thought leadership surrounding information security issues presented at major industry conferences such as RSA and other security ven venues including B-Sides, uh, ILTA and ISSA. And so Mike is going to talk to us about forgotten gems, old security holes with companies, uh, which companies still miss. Please welcome Mike. Okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, one of the challenges in security, and most of the people in this room know this, is, um, you know, new flaws come out, 
day to day. The hype cycle builds. You scramble to catch them, but you know your your total attack surface is always in aggregate. You know it always includes all the new stuff, all the old stuff, um, things that are inside uh, compliance and best practices, things you know that are uh, maybe non traditional tactics, but they'll still get the job done. And so. When I started putting this kind of talk together, um, it was really based on the fact that when I first got into security, uh, I started working with a lot of pen penetration testers. You know, my my personal focus is more on vulnerability scanning technology and assessment engines and uh, checks, things like that. And a lot of people in this room are familiar with that technology. Um, but when a new flaw would come out, I'd always go over to our penetration test teams, you know, who do uh, perform consulting services, and I'd say, "Hey, this new vector came out. Are you guys using this? You know, are you, you know, is it useful in your engagements?" And more often than not, uh, the response was no. It, it, it's actually we, we don't need that stuff. We just we're just using the same tactics we always use. We're still effective, you know. Every now and then, you know, with something like heart lead comes out and. Uh, domain credit or passwords, usernames and passwords are leaking onto uh, public IP space. Yeah, that that is highly useful. But um, one of the things that you know I noticed is that there still seems to be a lot of um, you know for things like spear phishing, other sorts of kind of core tactics. There's still a lot of confusion over how widely available certain vectors are, and I wanted to come here and talk about that. Today, um, typically this talk has you know a couple parts. I talk about you know kind of going through the data breach cycle. You talk about original entry point. You talk about payloads. You talk about lateral movement. Um, but as I've kind of talked to people and gone through uh, elements of this talk before, it seems like uh, original entry point and spoofing uh, consistently generates the most interest. And the reason is is there's still a lot of confusion over what's possible and just how uh, new technologies such as DKIM and SPF protect you uh, from that. And so that's that's kind of the focus today is really um, uh, just kind of diving into spoofing uh, in detail. Uh, now that you know a lot of the world's kind of moved on from PGP and kind of end-user focus authentication technologies, it's gone up to the corporate level. And uh, but when we work engagements, it seems like people are interested in the payloads. They're interested in lateral movement. That's stuff, but what they're really surprised about is their email security posture is actually a lot less than uh, they thought it was. And so we'll we'll give some details. Uh, talk about popular email clients. I'll actually show you how things get represented on Gmail. You know when things are spoofing in. Uh, what. Uh, maybe shortcomings of uh, various approaches, and uh, you know, as far as uh, email goes, it really is still the top direct vector um, for original entry point. Sometimes, like I said, sometimes you'll get in through a VPN server. Sometimes you'll get a foothold through some other means. There's a lot of hype about mobile, but if you go through, you know, uh, either a red team engagement or you start reading kind of after action reports from data breaches, a lot of times uh, that original entry point through email uh, is still a, a very major factor. Um, and the other thing I'd say is it, it, from a security perspective, you really need to worry about both the direct and the uh, indirect uh, for this. Uh, and the reason is remote access is now so prevalent that if you get a payload sent to your personal email and end up executing it, and that computer has uh, remote access capability, at least during certain times of day, into the corporate network, um, that is, you know, effectively or many times still uh, as bad or almost as bad as getting it directly on a corporate endpoint itself. So, um, so still an important topic. Um, and the last thing I'll say is not enough visibility into real world examples. I've heard this is kind of a theme I've heard even even through speakers today uh, at this conference that you know I, you know there was a blog post I saw one time that said you know why don't we have an NTSB for um, you know for data breach attacks? Like why is it that you know when an airliner goes down or something else uh, 
there's all this post-analysis, exactly what went wrong, where was the breakdown, all sorts of other things. Uh, when data breach attacks occur, you typically don't get a lot of data out. You know, they say, well, Sony was hacked. Every now and then, you'll actually get a very hyper-detailed rundown on how that occurred, uh, but a lot of times you don't. Um, I'd say probably the best, you know, pro I'd say probably the best um, kind of corollary to that would be uh, reading kind of after action reports from penetration tests and things that go ahead and tend to pop up during those. And so um, this attempts to provide a little bit of visibility into uh, some of these tactics. So um, one thing I'll say about well-crafted spear phishing emails, um, oftentimes they surprise even senior IT staff. Um, you know, they think it's no longer an issue today, and we'll talk about why that is and the technologies that are deployed to stop this and maybe shortcomings of them. And uh, the other thing is, is they believe services handle it under default configurations or, you know, at the security appliance level, but um, what you got to understand is that delivery is still key, you know. I mean, it is still something where um, vendors know that if you are blocking legitimate traffic under kind of default circumstances, that will really burn you a lot more than letting a few things through that should not. And so, you know, there's kind of a default on state uh, for that. So back in the day, you know, back, you know, I, I'd say people were actually better about uh, combating this and being aware of it 10 years ago than they are today because of uh, some of the new technologies they think are protecting them from it. Uh, you know, in years past, you, you would just do an NS lookup through DNS with a mail exchange. You know, you tell them at the port 25, you craft your message, you put it in whatever raw headers you want, and you just send away. Uh, you didn't need an email client. You can just use, you know, kind of the TCP capabilities of Telnet or Netcat or whatever else. Um, that stopped working, you know, uh, and it really stopped working more because it wasn't so much that people were trying to prevent spear phishing as all the spam and other sorts of things that go along with it. And so now if you try that today, you'll see something like this, you know, 554, your access to this mail system has been rejected. Um, a lot of times you wouldn't be able to go ahead and connect directly due to reputation and MPA, uh, kind of whitelist, blacklist, and so... You know, that, that's no longer effective. Um, you know, classic protection mechanism, too, before we start talking about the new stuff, um, back in the day was PGP. You know, that, that was really the mechanism that people deployed. Uh, and really, great, great technology, and tried to do, you know, check all the big boxes. Uh, you get encryption, you get digital signatures, um, uh, great compatibility standard, uh, still used today. In fact, I actually think that technology is more useful for kind of core systems, you know, interactions and verification than it is for email. Um, but the challenge with it is it offloaded a substantial burden onto the end user at the corporate level. Um, and just out of curiosity, uh, this is kind of security pride. How, how many people still use PGP? Can I see a show of hands? So it, it, it's still, if you look around, it's still, even in a security crowd, it's really light. You know, it really has not um, kind of made its way through. And nothing against PGP and, you know, GPG, great technology, but uh, corporations realize that, you know, the challenges of key distribution, of having kind of expert users um, generating new keys in the event that they had some kind of a, a loss. It, it was just, you were offloading too much burden onto... Um, the end user. People wanted to up at the infrastructure level. You know, they wanted the same protections. They wanted encryption. They wanted um, authenticity, you know, and integrity verification, but they looked to other things to go ahead and do that. So, go to the next slide here. They, what they really went to is a combination of things. You know, for encryption, uh, people started requiring uh, start TTLS support, which is Essentially, you know, if I'm sending across public segments, let's make sure that everything's wrapped in a SSL protocol. That, that's important, you know, it checks the encryption box. Not so important for a spoofing scenario because it's just, uh, it's just transport level, you know. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, kind of how people have generally attempted to check that box. Um, for signatures and combating spoofing, they went to two different things. One was a 
DCAM, which is called Domain Keys Identified by Mail, and uh, SPF records. Uh, now, Domain Key DCAM is really, what both these do is they're, they're both similar. They kind of try to uh, check boxes with uh, different techniques, though DCAM puts a uh, public uh, a public key up in the DNS server of a corporation. Uh, that way, in the event that a mail message is mailed out from the corporation, um, that public key can be retrieved and used to verify that that message did in fact come from a email server, which is allowed to go ahead and send and you know authenticated messages. Um, with SPF, similar, but instead they basically said, look, if, if it's not originating from these IP address ranges, don't trust it. You know, it's something that um, it's something that's a problem. Wouldn't wouldn't necessarily go into that. Um, the way this often shows up, like in a an email client, is if you click into that little box, you'll see mailed by. Um, that's SPF at work. Um, and then the signed by, that is DCAM at work. You know, this is kind of a classic Google case. Um, now, there's problems with these technologies. In fact, when I was first working on this talk, I actually thought that um, the default case would be quite a bit stronger when I was running tests with, uh, you know, either clients or, you know, kind of working on various aspects of this talk. Um, I actually thought a lot of it would have to do with DCAM key cracking. And the reason is, is uh, in 2013, there was a guy named Zach Harris, a mathematician up in Pennsylvania, and he basically discovered that Google in particular, along with a lot of other major um, players, were using 512-bit RSA keys still to do their DCAM signing. And the reason that's important is 512-bit RSA keys are very, very crackable. Um, I think, you know, they were probably first cracked in the 98 time frame in terms of computer hardware. You know, back in that time frame, you know, that's like up at the nation state level or something like that. Um, these days, you know, that's actually down to 24, 24 to 48 hours on modern hardware. Um, I asked a couple of my friends to check this out. And they basically said it's about $150 of Amazon EC2 time if you want to crack that key. And once you crack it, uh, that gives you access to go ahead and send signed mail, not just for a particular user, as you would in the PGP case. You actually get to sign, you actually get to send signed mail for the entire corporation. Um, anytime that Google has a security flaw, Google's so good at stuff like this that anytime it's a Google flaw, you got to pay attention because it typically means that everybody else has that flaw and then some. And so you, you've got to really uh, say, okay, now I've got to audit for this as well. You know, uh, when we do vulnerability assessment, a lot of times people are used to checking boxes on um, vulnerabilities, but a lot of times emails and email relays, because they don't typically show up as a unique IP address, or maybe you have to do special things to access them, a lot of times they're unaware, or at least previously unaware, of the um, knowledge of you know things like it. You know, what is the key length of the DKIM key I'm sending out? You know, can people just crack that and start sending authenticated messages around the internet? Um, but as we did more experience, as we uh, did more experiments, we found out that um, it really is something where most clients, even with email security options configured, um, they verify it, but they're not handling it properly. Kind of as you go through. Uh, as it, things work their way through the security chain. What they're really using is things like MPA. Uh, what's happened is uh, a lot of times uh, corporate systems, particularly email systems, um, the focus has traditionally remained on anti-spam uh, and heuristics surrounding that. And that in some ways has masked the security function of uh, DKIM and SPF. People think they're relying on those. What they're actually relying on is uh, MTA reputation. Like, who's talking to me? Uh, are they a spammer? Things like that. Blacklist, whitelist. And what they're not looking at is, um, is you know, the actual authenticity information and properly filtering it. So, in order to run some tests, um, went ahead and actually um, uh, said, okay, well, how do we go ahead and come from really good uh, reputation MPA? And uh, that's really easy these days because virtual private servers abound. 
they're associated. You roll up any name registrar, um, any major hosting company, 20 bucks a month, and you've got yourself a virtual private server. And the great thing about those is they will send out through a mail relay that is essentially unfilterable because, you know, in some cases 100,000 domains send out through those relays as well. You know, they can't really go on a blacklist. You can't really filter them down to a particular domain effectively because every everything goes through there. You would go ahead and knock out all kinds of uh, deliverables. Um, and you know, the great thing about VPS too, um, it's totally anonymous. You know, you can go ahead and play pay in Bitcoin if you want to at several uh, several registrars. It gives you fine grained control over output, and it really takes MPA reputation completely out of the mix. So, you know, using Gmail as an example, and the reason I use Gmail is um, there's lots of different mail clients um, and there's lots of different corporations. Um, a lot of companies have now switched to Google Business, uh, Gmail for Google Business. A lot of end users actually use Gmail as well for um, uh, for their personal email accounts. So in the event that you know someone's going ahead and trying to fool you or target you, saying, well, how does Gmail handle this is something you really want to know. Um, now, good news about Gmail is uh, in the event that you try to spoof, even with really uh, really good MPA from outside of Gmail, they'll tell you about it. You know, They'll say, okay, you're coming from outside of Gmail, you're pretending to be inside, and look, I, you know, I'm, the interesting thing is they still deliver it, they just put this big nasty warning message at the top, and that, that's a pretty good warning message. I mean, that that's something that will alert people, they'll say, okay, this is a... Uh, this is not something I'm necessarily going to trust. Maybe send me an attachment. I'm not going to go ahead and go in. This actually is the regular folder. It actually goes to the regular folder, surprisingly enough. So it does pop up the nasty warning message, but it is regular folder. No, that's that's a great question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about folders more in a second. Um, you know, downside of Gmail, though, and I actually saw this with Outlook Web Access as well, um, is uh, even if your DPM records are perfect, like we're going to look at bankofamerica.com because you know, that's something we really want to get DPM records for. And uh, nothing against our IT staff, they checked all the boxes. You know, they've got, uh, if you look it up, you know, in some sort of a record validation service, they checked all the boxes. They got all their SPF syntax correct. They got their DPM keys correct. Uh, everything's valid. They're ready to roll, ready to ensure they don't get spoofed. Um, but when you go ahead and you actually send in from a major MTA, um, no warning. You know, you actually go ahead, everything sails through. You can be supported at makeofamerica.com. You can be anyone from makeofamerica.com. So despite, you know, DKIM and SPF, uh, not only does it deliver to the default folder, uh, you don't even get this, the warning message, you know. So even though um, it's supposed to be handled, now, if you drill into that little white box, which no one ever does, um, you would expect to see mailed by in red, you know, saying, okay, well, there was an SPF violation here. You'd expect to see signed by, uh, maybe in red, saying we couldn't verify the signature. You actually don't even see that. It just drops those two fields. And it just says, uh, this is who it's from, this is who it's to, uh, this is the date. And... Uh, Yeah, I, I think. Um, if if you actually go all the way into the details, which is not visible by default, it will show you. It doesn't necessarily flag as a violation. It just says this is what I could go ahead and verify. So it seems to be default. It kind of gives you a thumbs up. It doesn't seem to give you a thumbs down. Yeah, I'll I'll go more into details on Google now. Uh, a second, though. Um, I, I would say that random observations are, um, and this is actually true working with other uh, kind of corporate users doing security training. Um, users get really confused by this, and the reason is there's a lot of um, bad training out there when it comes to things like DNS and uh, URLs, things like that. Um, They've been so trained, and rightly so, when going through um, 
uh, going through URLs and going through uh, training, like you'll you'll see things like this. They'll basically say, look, hey, uh, PayPal pops up, you know, even if it's in green, you know, if you look at the actual sending address and it's not from PayPal, then you know that's a sign that you know things aren't right. Uh, unfortunately. Um, that, that's not really the case. You know, spoofing is still prevalent, still very, very accessible. And so, even when you see good mails go through, um, or e even when you see, it, it's like the crude attempts are the ones that people tend to train on. Uh, part of the reason for this, part of the reason people often choose, uh, you know, things like PayPal at online.net as the source address is because they want to get two way communication going. You know, if you're just sending really good spoof, emails into a location, uh, replies to it will actually go to the original source, you know, in the event that you're coming from, you know, you're, you're running some, uh, you know, scam from uh, Eastern Europe or something like that, you're going to need that two-way communication. So that two-way communication case is what makes its way into the training process. Um, that's not, uh, that's not actually the, um, that's not actually the case, though, for kind of one-shot messages. Uh, a lot of times, working with uh, penetration test groups, what they want to do is they want to either come in as a highly trusted employee, and I'll talk about kind of ways that um, you get kind of additional verification of that, or they'll exploit what's known as kind of a loose trust relationship. They'll say something like, uh, they'll scout out a company and they'll say, hey, I know that my, um, uh, I know that my healthcare provider is Cigna, and so, even though these people don't, or uh, I know that you know this company I've been researching them, it's it's Cigna. So I'll I'll go ahead and I'll send them some messages from Cigna. Um, that way, they probably would expect to get them. It wouldn't look unsolicited. But it's also not the sort of thing where, you know, if they go and they send a reply to support at Cigna .com or something else like that, it's going to send any red flags. Everyone will just assume that somebody else sent it. So. Um, now you send a fake message from an employee who's sitting right next to you, or is sin, r sitting right next to the person who is um, ultimately receiving the message, that can set off all kinds of red flags. So, um, you know, the tactics around this are a little bit interesting, but still, still very, um, uh, still very prevalent. So, uh, you know, something else I noticed when running tests too is, um, this is also the case for Gmail for Business. So one, one other note about Gmail is um, they're really good at flagging these warnings uh, for Gmail. If you are using a Gmail for Business account, uh, even if they are kind of admin for the domain, um, you're not going to see this warning, at least in the experiments I did. So even though uh, Google for Business was saying, hey, I, we're hosting on this, we're running all our email through it, um, Messages coming from outside the domain were not flagged as um, suspicious, you know. Um, I believe there is additional beacon setup you can do to do that. It just is not the default. So, and that, that tends to surprise people as well. Um, next thing I want to talk about is profile photos. Um, when you're sending spoof messages in, you actually get um, kind of the benefits of... Um, you know, the nice profile photos that go along with these apps and these services. So, uh, a lot of people now, when you get a message from somebody, you know, you hover over and you'll see something like this. You know, you'll see, uh, who sent me this? Uh, it's this guy, I know him, he's a friend of mine. Um, those don't travel with the email message, they sit in the address book and they are pulled up, you know, based on uh, a email corresponding with your address book, and as a result, uh, you get kind of even more feeling of authenticity when these messages are going in, you know. Uh, there's no signing around that uh, that face popping up or that picture popping up, and so that, that gives a lot more of a authenticity feel to people. Um, in fact, when I was originally running experiments with people, they kept saying, you know, it's really amazing that you were able to figure out exactly what my profile photo was and send it in. You know, it looks very authentic. <laughs> I, was, I actually didn't know what they were talking about. I was like, is that, did I do that? You know, and, uh, and, uh, and that's really what it turned out to be was, um, it's just default 
system settings actually working to go ahead and add authenticity to uh, the email, you know, these, these spoofing tests. So. It, it still it's it still pops up it still pops up yeah <laughs> right right and so and that I, when I talk to people afterwards you know who kind of work in engagements like that they actually said yeah the picture gave more credibility to me than anything else in the message you know it was actually the picture that you know I said yeah I mean I, I see the guy's face I know it's him you know it's the same same picture I always get you know so they they treat it almost as if it was a signature element at the bottom of the page you know which you see kind of in the footer. Um, you know, so I, I'd say, you know, conclusions to this are, um, you know, just don't make assumptions on your corporate email setup. If I had to guess, and I work with a lot of clients on this, uh, all, almost always the configuration that we see is it's configured for anti-spam and heuristics. Um, it will still deliver things through. Uh, depending on your setup, you may get some sort of a warning. Oftentimes, you'll get no warning whatsoever. Um, there are some sites that do testing for this, you know, and they advertise like deadfake.com, send anonymous emails.net. Um, those sites don't have very good delivery rates, and so a lot of times I work with people and I said, I I tested this out using online tools. I know it's good. Um, I, I'd say if you're on IT security staff, just test it yourself. You know, you get a VPS for 20 bucks a month. You know, try to see if you can go ahead and, uh, you know, mail yourself from your CEO's email address and see what pops up. See how it looks in your, uh, maybe not your CEO's email address, maybe your email address. But, uh, um, you know, and, uh, you know, DKIM SPF, it's great, but uh, you got to make sure your policies drop um, and you have effective violation warnings. Preferably, it should go straight into the spam folder. You know, even violation warnings in the inbox depending on how those profile photos pop up, may not be effective. People are used to seeing a lot of warnings. So um, uh, I'd also say verify your company's DKIM key length. If you crack a DKIM key, and you know, even for major corporations these days, uh, looking around, you still see a lot of 512-bit DKIM keys. Uh, even a virtually perfect email setup, you'll still sail through just fine. And you'll actually get even additional kind of green check marks next to the message saying it's, it's effective. So, you know, if you're going through your security audits and you're thinking, uh, I mean, a lot of times you talk to companies and they're always focused on their SSL keys because there's a lot of good SSL auditing tools out there. You know, how's the security of my website doing? Um, that's important. Um, but I, I'd say your DKIM keys are probably quite a bit more important. So... Nothing against strengthening your SSL setup, your SSL ciphers. That stuff's great, but um, you know, make sure that you actually check the uh, RSA keys that are sitting on your mail server because those are the most crackable keys out there. And uh, the last thing I say is don't confuse MTA reputation with security. You know, anti-spam and authentication. Uh, you know, there's some overlap there, but they really are two different things. And so, you know, that's something where you want to go into your security setup, you know, today and say, you know, what can I do to better lock down uh, my setup, maybe even open some eyes, um, really focusing on your email posture is what, probably the best thing you can do. Um, you know, about six months ago when I started running experiments like this, um, working in tandem with pen testers, uh, you know, one thing that really opened our eyes is I always said, you know, you... If someone's a really good penetration tester, you can't really target them to spear phishing emails. You know, it's just it's too difficult. You know, they're too well educated. You won't ever really get a hit off of that. You know, you might get IT security staff. Um, maybe then you know you get you go into other parts of the organization. It's tougher and tougher. Um, with packets like this, we are, I actually have seen pen testers get uh, uh, get actually compromised, which is not something I expected. You know, so uh, it's um, it really it really does have an impact. Um, I would say, um, yeah, you know, if if you're interested in this, uh, go ahead and shoot me an email. Uh, I won't send you any fake emails, you know, unless you want me to. <laughs> but I, I can go ahead and actually run you through. Hey, you know, if you want to go ahead and try this out yourself, you know, here's how you do it. Um, and like I said, you know, this is something where, as we've done security audits with companies, this is probably the one thing that um, drops JAWS more than uh, most of the other vulnerabilities and other sorts of things that we flat on there. It's just high element of surprise. So, uh, 
Any any questions? Yes. Nope. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. So. Thank you.